Yes. Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to our continuing discussion where we talk to professors, writers, reporters, columnists, philosophers, activists, anybody who has an opinion on political division in America from a more thoughtful perspective. We want to bring the information directly to you, the public, so that you could do this thing that was popular when I was in high school. It's not that popular now. It's called thinking for yourself. And uh, maybe we'll have a renaissance with that. Maybe we won't. Uh, this is our first twofer. We're going to have two professors for one interview. So this is a this is a historic moment for the interview series. This is our first twofer. Uh, with us today is Ann M. Oberhauser and Daniel Cryer. They are both professors of sociology, and they both work at Iowa State University. And they both seem to like each other because they work on a couple uh, studies together. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Oberhauser is a professor of sociology at Iowa State University. Her research focuses on feminist economic geography, gender and globalization, and critical development studies with an emphasis on rural economic strategies in Appalachia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the Midwest. She holds a PhD in geography from Clark University before moving to Ames, Iowa as professor in the Department of Geology and Geography at West Virginia University. Oberhauser's scholarship draws heavily from interdisciplinary feminist research and scholarships that engage with livelihoods, community-based development, and gender issues in the Global South and Global North. Her books include the co-edited Bridging Worlds, Building Feminist Geographies, Essays in Honor of Janice Monk, uh, co-authored Feminist Spaces, Gender and Geography in the Global Context, and co-edited with Abipo Johnston Anu Monwo, Global Perspectives on Gender and for Space, in collaborating with sociology colleagues, Oberhauser has worked on projects exploring the political culture of the Midwest, and specifically how populism and nativism are evident in recent pivotal elections. That's what we're going to be focused on today. Uh, Professor Cryer co-hosted, co-organized and hosted the 2016 International Social Theory Consortium in Ames and organizes an ongoing series of symposia on new directions in critical social theory that brings sociologists, philosophers, cultural theorists, and political scientists to Iowa State University for intense, focused exchange of ideas. Article books by Dan on critical social theory and political economy have been published in Critical Sociology, Current Perspectives in Social Theory, American Journal of Economics and Sociology, Fast Capitalism, Continental Thought and Theory, Logos, Journal of Rural Social Studies, and Sociology Quarterly. Most recently, Dan published Political Moderation and Polarization in the Heartland, Economics, Rurality, and Social Identity in the 2016 Presidential Election. We'll be looking at that today. Dan has received numerous teaching awards, including the Early Achievement Teaching Award from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Department of Sociology's Bogardus Award, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Introductory Teaching Award, and was named the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences Shakes Half Master teacher in humanities and social sciences. Dan teaches a variety of courses from large enrollment introduction sessions to distance learning. Uh, we'll leave it there. Today, we wanted to talk about this study. And I just found out from the professors, and I'm ashamed to admit this, but it's true. I did not know this other study had come out. We will also be covering this one, Populism and Identity Politics in the U.S. Heartland that came out in 2022. As I understand, I might be getting this wrong. The professors are saying that's a sequel to this study, Political Moderation and Polarization in the Heartland, Economics, Rurality, and Social Identity in the 2016 U.S. Presidential Election. But first, let me turn to the professors. Did I say anything wrong? Do we need to correct something about the bio? Was there something we, we need to um, change or get out now? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you if you wish, you could do a more Germanic pronunciation of my last name, clear? Can we do it? Clear? Clear. Uh, but that's fine. I, I answer to almost anything. So, uh, no, is that is that German? Yeah, it is actually Luxembourgian, but that's fine. And German's good, so that's good. Luxembourg. My my father uh, served in Germany and NATO. Yeah. So I, I know. Okay. Uh, no. okay. Honestly, I really do respond to almost anything. So uh, we're going to go with Creer, uh, Professor Oberhauser, and Professor Creer. Uh, if the introductions are correct, tell me what this study was in 2016. We'll get to the other study in 2022, but the question I want to ask you is the one I ask all the professors. I Please answer as both an academic as and as an American with two working eyeballs. Why did you write this study? 
And why did you think it was important to do this in 2019? What was going on then? Why was this an important topic then? Perhaps, you know, maybe underneath the study was an interest that Anne as a geographer, a political geographer, and myself share, which is uh, where we've both been interested in kind of the spatialization of, of, uh, uh, of culture and of value systems. Um, I'm, I'm still working on a book uh, that I started about the time that we started the study on uh, tracing sort of different religious um, value systems. And um, I'm, you know, just to be real blunt, I was really interested in the historic North, South, East, West divisions in America, the sections North, South, the Civil War, and then the kind of the East, West divisions as well, you know, the frontier and different kinds of culture, even different kinds of religion that, ex that find themselves sort of institutionalized in law, institutionalized in, in even like the built environment in each of these different places. Iowa um, has, you know, in sort of political geography, Iowa has long been a kind of uh, exemplar of a kind of northern, uh, we're western to a degree, but kind of northern in uh, political value. It's a kind of communitarian uh, value system, probably the best way to put it. Historically, Iowa has been a place where um, something like cultural diversity mattered. Uh, uh, communities, um, you, we, again, this was a northern state. It doesn't have the legacy of slavery. Um, it's not a western state. It, 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 the, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the, um, so so it, 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 had a, it had a kind of a communitarian uh, basis and, and, and you know, it was first in the nation in terms of the uh, presidential uh, primary season right. for about 45 or 50 years uh, with the Iowa caucuses, which were different than primaries because people came together in small groups and talked and shared ideas and tried to convince each other and so on. So, in, in, so perhaps the second word in the title is actually what links Anne and I together, which is interest in moderation. So polarization, um, you know, is really this division, this growing division in value systems and political uh, um, uh, orientations. But moderation is really what Iowa historically, and especially in like the, the political geography literature was noted for. Moderation. So what is moderation? Political moderation is really the capacity for, you know, uh, members of a uh, of, of a citizenry or of a body politic to communicate across differences, right? So politi political moderates aren't people that are lukewarm, but they're people who occupy a position where they can mediate between the, you know, a, a wide variety of positions and, and talk through them, talk about them. So I was a place that valued moderation. It doesn't mean lukewarm. It was a place that valued moderation, which meant that, that something like engaging in inclusive discourse, listening, understanding, valuing people despite having opposing uh, viewpoints and so on, uh, being able to sort of shake hands at the end of a, of a dispute and, uh, and be able to live and work alongside of each other. So the way I teach it is, I was the kind of place where people who are very different can work together, right? I may not agree with you. I may have a different notion of God than you, but I can work with you. And that was basically the Iowa way, right? That's and, and again, it's pretty well documented in the literature, kind of, right? So um, I we um, were a bit surprised by the outcome of the 2016 election, and um, and the polling didn't show the the real strong. Um, win uh, uh, for um, uh, for Donald Trump that he wound up obtaining here. Um, uh, Donald Trump hadn't, I, I gotta remember this right now, in 2016, he didn't win uh, the Iowa caucuses. I think the winner in 2016 was Ted Cruz. And is that correct? I think that's right. Yeah, I think that is right. So, so it, he didn't seem to have a kind of runaway uh, uh, a win going into the primaries. Only a couple of polls that showed it. But in the end, uh, Iowa was one of the states that swung the most. So after having voted for uh, Barack Obama twice. Um, 2008, 2012. Yeah, we wound up having you know, about a, a 10 point uh, um, you know, spread uh, between 
Hillary Clinton and, and Donald Trump. So, you know, there's regional differences even within Iowa. Different parts of Iowa have different kind of cultural heritage and cultural backgrounds. Um, but it's probably a less gerrymandered state than most. There's only four congressional districts and so on. So it, 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 it seemed like a good place to sort of um, understand the changes that were evidenced in, in, um, in the MAGA movement uh, in the 2016 election. We were very interested in what happened in 2018, 2020, right? So this doesn't seem to be a one-off. This seems to be like a something yeah something like an, uh, like a real change in the underlying uh political culture here at least in iowa um and in other some sort of the rural uh, uh midwest so does that do enough so and, yeah but but before we yeah. before we go uh, just to be fair professor oberhauser is yes. do you agree i i'm sorry i have to do this you're both here and yeah. why don't you ask her and especially my mom's watching this so i gotta be on the oh, yeah. okay Absolutely. so professor oberhauser is that how you felt? Is that what motivated you to do this study? You could say yes, or you could disagree, whatever you want, but I had to ask. No, 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 no. I, I appreciate the, the gender balance here. And um, so I think yeah. I, was gonna, I was gonna add to some of Dan's earlier points, especially in how he came into this kind of from this cultural, more sociological, political perspective. And, and I do have the geography background that I, I do in human geography, I look at place, I look at identity, and I look at how <clears throat> people identify with their place. Places shape people, and of course people shape, shape uh, places. But I find this particularly within Iowa, within parts of the Midwest, I'm originally from the Midwest, as is Dan, and I think place is really important to people. Um, so, and that plays out in terms of the political landscape, economic, social landscape, um, as Dan was talking about with religion, et cetera. So, you know, I think it's, it's really interesting, again, to pick up on this shift that's taken place in the last decade, is how kind of this place is kind of transformed and through politics, but I also think through social and cultural dimensions of these of this broader region and um it's i, th I think it you say you asked the question maybe we're jumping ahead a little bit but you asked the question okay. uh yeah is has this changed and i don't know i think even it's more entrenched um some of the polarization that we saw in the 2016 2020 is even more entrenched now or at least through legislation and through some of the things, the bills that are being passed, particularly in Iowa, but in other parts of the country as well. Um, you know, there's some uh, very kind of aggressive and conservative social issues and bills that are being passed. So let, that me, is ask you, let me ask you about the study. We'll get to that in a second. But to again, to be fair, Professor Creer. <laughs> you, you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is a twofer. My, bear with me. It's my first twofer. Good Professor, uh, Professor Creer. Uh, by the way, my stepdad is German, German, German. His last name is Hirschbach, and they can trace the name to a part of a river bank in Germany. So, just putting that out there. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, like my my mom's Mexican, my dad's uh, German, and she goes, "Well, let's find our name." And so they went looking for Ruiz. There's a million. We can't we, sure. we trace it till it's, you know, someplace in Mexico. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. Professor uh, Trier, do you, I'm sorry. Do you, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I agree with Anne and the uh, uh, place attachment is very strong here. And in, I think place attachment is much stronger in rural parts of the world in general, rural parts of America than it is in mm. some and, and urban areas. People don't move as often, right? And they, they can trace their family back generations often on a single piece of land in a single town. People know your name. They know your reputation uh, by name and so on. So it's a, it's a different thing. The pride you drive around Iowa yet, uh, the pride that that um, that Iowans show for their town. Um, we have 99 counties. We have extension agents. That's who actually helped us, the county extension agent, uh, to do our focus group interviews. And there's just tremendous pride and sense again, kind of sense of attachment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 
that shows itself in right. in these rural parts of America. So that's again kind of why we were surprised to see things change so dramatically. And uh, you would think that there would be a kind of consistency across time in terms of the orientation of politics. And then to see, um, and to, you know, was ultimately not in this study, but in the other one, we, we talked to people and interviewed them about uh, the changes that were underway in their towns and communities to that seem to explain either why it was happening or that um, um, people talked about the impact of the increasing polarization on their communities, right? That kind of thing. So, just, so that, so really, I agree. With, I mean, Ann and I've talked so much about this. I, I there's nothing Ann could say I wouldn't agree with. Him. I, I know you guys are in depth with the conversation. And you've known each other for a few years. I just got to parse it out so that nobody can go. Well, you didn't ask the other professor. You don't know. Both of them said that. I got them both in, saying that. In, in general, we can actually say this. In general. Everything good about these this work is and if there's mistakes, it was me. So we'll just we'll just get that. Okay, out okay, okay. Let me let me ask you about the actual research. So if I can, I'd like to read the uh, the background of that study. The 2016 U.S. presidential election was a watershed event that signaled decreasing pol signaled decreasing political moderation and increasing partisan polarization, authoritarianism, and ethno nationalism. Iowa, located at the center of the American heartland, swung to the political right more than any other state. Multivariate regression analysis of county-level data is used to determine the relative contribution of factors reputed to have caused voters to support Trump. Rurality, economic distress, and social identity. However, we find that rurality and social identity, but not economic distress, were significantly correl correlated with Iowa's swing to Trump. Polarization along these social... Divisions must be addressed if the heartland is to return to political moderation. So uh, are you saying a lot of people voted for Trump? I know my stepdad, I don't like Trump. My mom doesn't either, but he voted for him for economics. But it sounds like what you're saying is that while economics is an issue, maybe a lot of people voted for him. When we get to the heartland, it's a little bit different. There's more of a concern about social identity, the identities attached to kind of a rural geography. And that was the primary motivator for why people voted for Trump. Am I getting this wrong? Yeah, I, I think that there's, you know, people like dent, rural people, probably particularly farmers, people in agriculture can really identify with the land as Dan was saying, go, but it goes back multiple, three, four, five generations in some cases. So they're really attached to the land. And, I, and in many senses, they're opposed to or threatened by change. Mm -hmm. You know, you just get kind of stuck. This is the way parents, grandparents, great grandparents farmed land, dealt with the cattle, etc. And there we were kind of observing too with our interviews is many of them are many people are rural people are threatened by this change. So land ownership is changing dramatically. There's more consolidation of big big agriculture, big farms, people are threatened by that. There's um an influx of migrant labor. So in the meatpacking plants, uh, parts of Waterloo, parts of Storm Lake, you know, places yes. in the Northeast, Northwest, um, a lot of infl influx of migrant labor, which is necessary for the agriculture and for those sectors. But nonetheless, people are threatened by that because their schools are changing and there's dual or bil bilingual um, you know, in, in education or in the schools that are needed. So those kind of, the, both the social, kind of those rural things are overlapping. And of course, with the MAGA and with a lot of the more populist, um, ethno-nationalist rhetoric of the ultra-right or the conservative, that resonated with many of these rural folks. So I think that too is pretty attractive and helped understand help us understand this change have you heard of bill bishop and the concept of the big sort yes thank you uh so bill bishop roughly for the viewers um says that roughly since the 1990s could go back earlier i'm picking the 90s americans have been sorting themselves out they've been moving to communities and what we're getting is more of a people live in like-minded ideological communities. So you are a conservative in San Francisco, you move to Iowa. You are a 
liberal in Texas, you move to Los Angeles. And while there is some debate on if people are intentionally moving and saying, I want to go to a place where everyone votes like me, or if they're more attracted to values signals or lifestyle signals. And then when they move to the area, over time, they gradually adopt the voting patterns of their neighborhood. Um, I'm not too concerned about that. I'm, I'm really just trying to get at, and we talked about this in the early thing, is the big sort real? Is it happening? Are people more ideologically divided? Are they sorting themselves out or are they not? Because I have a few professors who I showed them the map of the big sort and they hold up their hand and said, I reject your map. What is the public to think? Sounds like you guys are saying morality is part of social identity and that the big sort is happening and you literally just watched part of it. Am I getting this wrong or is there something to this? I when we start, sure. so I would just, so our data for this paper was quantitative data um, assembled from a variety of sources. There's a lot of, of uh, rural um, sociology research done up here, databases that we drew upon. Most of it came from the Census Bureau, actually. So we were actually looking at, you know, IRS 99 counties. So those patterns that we're identifying there emerged in the data. And uh, so we, we actually were trying to explain the vote shift in each county and correlating it with um, a, a variety of things, but the, 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 the items that really jumped out as significant was rurality, right? There's a measure of rurality, how large the county is, and then how distant the county is from a large metropolitan. Oh, oh. We have, so there's a standard measure it's called the Rural Urban Continuum Codes. They were, um, they're widely used up here. There are five different kind of gradation or continuum yeah. from With, very yeah. urban to very rural. Yeah. Five different categories. Yeah. That, yeah. With a total of nine, actually, it winds up being total of nine when they get the, the whole shebang yeah. in there. But, but I, Iowa doesn't have a lot, like the largest category. We, we don't have a large urban area in Iowa. We don't have one. We have Des Moines, which falls into the second code. And then we go all the way to these tiny counties that have less than a thousand people. But what we found was is that 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 mattered, right? That the that the size of the swing from the 28, 2008, 2012 vote for Obama to the swing to the 2016 vote for Donald Trump, that that the Republican share of the vote in each county was influenced. In fact, that was like the biggest influence was how rural the county was. And then how white it was. And oddly enough, we found that it was the, the whiter the county. So it wasn't counties that were directly experiencing demographic change or PUs, the language that, that, that Congressman Steve King uh, would, would point to, that there was a, a replacement of sort of um, the, the native population with outsiders, white, white and non-white, that the whiteness was like the higher the percentage of white, the more, the larger the swing. And then, um, and then the final one was education, that the lower the overall level of educational attainment in the county, the greater the swing. And so the Trump vote, the size of the swing at the county level here in Iowa was explained by the um, rurality, by, the, um, by whiteness and by education. And uh, I think that's it, correct? I, I, I didn't reread it today. So that's sound right, Anne? And I think you said you found the trend continued. Am I getting that wrong with this study? Uh, let me read the introduction, then I'll ask you about that and how they two relate. The rise of populism on the political right in the U.S. and Europe in recent decades reflects a significant shift in political culture. This populism has been associated with the rejection of mainstream politics and increasing, increased hostility towards immigrants, racialized minorities, and other marginalized groups who are seen as threats to economic security and hegemonic social identities in the U.S. heartland. Several key states flipped from Democrat to Republican in 2016, sealing Trump's win and leading to widespread debates about populist political attitudes in the region. This analysis draws from focus group discussions with community leaders in rural and micropolitan Iowa to understand how local discourses about economics and social change intersects with rising populist politics. Three characteristics of community life emerged as areas of concern among these groups, economic destabilization, economic destabilization, changes in social composition, and a profound sense of rurality, a profound sense of rurality. Our findings reveal how populism and identity movements on the political right are integrated with heartland political culture, contributing to the recent electoral successes 
of right-wing populist candidates. The discussion concludes with the recommendations to promote a progressive and inclusive agenda. Uh, did you find that the trend has continued in your 2022 study that it hasn't shifted back liberal? In fact, it's kind of gone right and stayed right and maybe even pushed even further to the right as time's going on. Yeah, I think that was, um, it, and it was a different perspective that we were looking at through this article, through these conversations with people. But in a way, it was just kind of a way of um, backing up or kind of reinforcing some of our quantitative findings and from the statistics and Census Bureau, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I think that people's, uh, and this was, we were doing these, a lot of these interviews actually just before COVID, so in 2019. We didn't quite finish. We had some set up alliance lined up for 2020, but unfortunately, we're not able to do those. Uh, but in 2019, so it was before the you know the next round of the presidential and general elections, and so this was top on people's minds, and it was a real hot topic and an issue for uh, people to talk about. And uh, you know, it's, there's variation. You cannot generalize about you know, communities or groups. Um, and that too is quite interesting. So I in particular, because I have a lot of interest in gender issues, was uh, looking at through this through a gender lens and seeing how people were describing the, the election, for example, and how they were see seeing Trump and some of the issues that were aligned with associated with Trump um, and how that has shaped, that also shaped people's issues. So in some cases, it was dividing households where a woman would be voting in one and uh, the, the man would be voting for another candidate. So it was, um, you know, kind of interesting to look at even some of these divisions. But overall, it was very, very, you know, tense and people were very, um, kind of, uh, it was a hot topic, let's say. So, right in, I'm sorry. Well, may if I may, so like I, I, I would, I think uh, of, a, so there, of the states that um, had been instrumental to the 2016 uh, uh, Republican presidential win, Iowa is one of the few that stayed the same. And I think we're the only state where each one of the, certainly the congressional districts, and I think even each county, I think it actually turned out that, that there weren't, there were only, I think it's either, I think it's six counties in Iowa that voted Democrat. And I think they voted Democrat, I think in each election. And it's really interesting. It wasn't a huge difference between 2016 and 2020, but the the, the red counties, the counties that have voted Republican, right, had a big swing, swung even more. Mm. And I think every blue county swung more blue. So so it wasn't huge, but you could see that the trend, Further device. yeah, it kept going. And that's what we found when we talked to people that, that, that you know, again, they just, they just described um, how, you know, again, being moderate. I mean, people, again, like we found very few people that we interviewed. They were professionals often or at least public leaders or, or well-known farmers and, you know, uh, really the county extension agent helped find them and, ha and helped organize all of this, of course. And, uh, but, you know, very few people would would ever voice like pride in being uh, intolerant or pride in uh, rejecting others, but they were very much able to report how incidents were occurring in their community uh, that signaled division and ongoing right. division and polarization. Right, yeah. from the bar scene to the church, to the schools, to their neighbors, to- Card clubs breaking up. <laughs> yeah, um, so it was a very divisive. Yeah. Probably continues to be so. One of the so we wound up going to one of the counties, Howard County, um, which I think, and right, that is that's the county in America that split. swung the most, right? It was just a massive swing, like northern, 50 northern part of the state, just on the Minnesota Iowa border. So we went there, we went to some other counties where the swing wasn't quite as large, but you know, again, like people very interesting, like people describe how the democrat republican divide which was probably of long standing but if you know anything about iowa republicans and iowa democrats they weren't polar they weren't like people you were right. 
talked to or something, right? There were people yeah. you were neighbors with, went to church with, your, your kids right. were same sport teams. A lot of these towns only have one high school. So you can't, you know what I mean? Like, like, like we don't have class-based high schools or something. It's all, we're all in this together, right? And, um, but, and people described uh, like a, churches that, that after the 2016 election, uh, if the pastor came out pro-Trump, that that it just sort of like there was a great sort going on even within mm -hmm. uh, uh, congregations that people would leave the church and that if another pastor would say, "Hey, I'm I'm inclusive, I'm okay with you know whatever the whatever the out groups were uh, uh, in the MAGA universe, if they express support for that, then you'd get." You know, again, people switching one congregation to another to make yeah. to make it work. And again, like long term friendship networks breaking up, families breaking up. Um, it, civil war. Like it really like <laughs> like a cold something like a micro scale cold civil war. Yeah. And um, and and then, you know, just a kind of uncomfortable, like like, again, the bar scene um, just, you know, it, I, you, you know, like people being like, I, I don't think they said like the bar was like, like either pro or anti Trump, but the, the big idea was that it was no longer right if you were a long term Democrat or long term Republican. Like many Democrats became Trump supporters, right? And, and they identified as that. And that, you know, you would get these circles at a bar that would show up with some regularity. And if you were different, you'd, you know, from the other side, you wouldn't want to go, right? They'd be based hostility. Wow. Um, so it sounds like the famous Iowa moderation, as I think the two of you described when we were talking earlier, of at the end of the day, you could shake a hand with the person, right? And part ways. Yeah. Sounds like that's dying and started dying in 2016. Am I getting that right? I'd say stressed, probably. Stressed. I think we have a stress yes. test underway. I don't think uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Going off the description, the two you just gave the last two minutes, I think the word is really stressed, not just stressed. I would um, say it would be. Continuing tension. Right? Yeah. Because they still have the moderation in, their yes. backs, in the backs of their heads, but. And, and, um, and, and, and they don't and, hang out with each other in their private lives anymore. We're still, we're still the Iowa nights. Maybe that's the Iowa nights. <laughs> but like, like and maybe it's just the people but I have uh, helped this but, interview, but they, they tended, again, they, I don't think there was anyone who boasted like really strongly of intolerance. Like I'm really, I'm sure. They were but very didn't, polite. Not publicly, and, yeah. uh, and there were people across the political divide at the table with us. And may, and they were still able to talk to each other, and they, so I think I think we'll be able to say it's broken if we can't if we have one of these focus groups again, yeah. and it and one political party won't show up or one, you know what I mean? If that happens, sure, we'll sure, but it, leave the room because we can't. That didn't happen. So that's why I think it's stressed, right? And rather, would you say rather than broken? Okay. Uh, so you, you, you got done talking about how everybody gets along, and then at the end of the thing, you were talking about how now people come in segregated clusters in the bar. Yeah. That doesn't sound good. I mean, just going off your own words, I, well, I wouldn't call that a slight dip. That seems right. like and your culture is being ripped out. And two, and looking at the current situation, like we're in the presence here, and you know, we're gearing up, as you well know, we're gearing up for the 2024. Um, so the landscape has changed because of the caucus deal um, yeah. and Biden running. Uh, so, but now all, a lot of the Republican presidential candidates are beginning to flock to Iowa, which is kind of feeding fuel on the fire in some ways, um, because I think too our politicians are positioning themselves um, alongside some of these candidates and they want to, you know, be chummy with Saint Desantis or Trump or Pence or whoever. Right. Uh, so I think it's it's kind of being refueled now, and and also still divided, still divided and polarized. Let me ask you a technical question. Um, I think you said when you both were looking at the data, you found it was not just the Republicans who went further out. It was the blue uh, blue counties and red counties became more blue and red. You found in Iowa. So is it? I see a lot of professors saying. It's 90% the Republicans and a tiny bit Democrats being more polarized. Does that seem accurate to you guys based well, upon your own research? Yeah, I, I would, you know, if you look at like, like Pew has uh, 
pretty good data about political polarization. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, it, it's right. And, and like, you, you, you know how it's mapped, right? It's like, there's a, um, yeah, let me try to, if I can get this, it's, it's, uh, um, why can't I get the right term for it? It's out hating. It's, it's out hating of the opposite party is called, I can't remember the term for it right now. I'm really embarrassed, but, but if you overlap on the bell, right, there's like a bell curve. Right. And it, you, there used to be a lot of overlap between um, the parties, and that overlap is going away. And then over time, we're finding fewer and fewer sort of moderates in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so there you go, right there. Good for you. That's it. Yeah. And so you're seeing that that there's this difference that's occurring. And I think it is probably both. Um, but the um, yeah. Yeah. And the, the term I'm looking, what's the term I'm looking for? Why can't I think of it? It's the one. It's so, so there's a term where it's kind of like the, the um, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it would be, it's a measure of out hating. It would be like, uh, like, do you view the opposite party as acceptable or do you view them as, as people that you could yes. hang out with or would you mind if your daughter married? Uh, yeah. The person, you know, so, so less tolerance. Much. Yeah. And, and, tolerance. And that the other party is now viewed as an existential threat. And I would say that's definitely going to be true on both sides. That, that, uh, that it be, and it isn't that the positions, I think that, I think that the data, I'm not sure it's this one, but I think data shows that there's been like, for example, the one that's on my door. <laughs> so uh, right now downstairs is the one that, and I don't know if you saw that, that there's an interest right now in understanding why men aren't applying to universities. Um, right. That there's it's, a big gender gap. Women. Yeah, I've seen women. that. I've seen that. And that in that I have on my door a map that in its pew, and it shows that 2015 is the year, was the last year that the majority of Republicans agreed with the vast majority of Democrats that um, that that yeah. colleges and universities are good for America. Mm -hmm. And that after the 2016 election, the majority, it's now it's like two thirds of Republicans say that colleges and universities are not good for America. Mm -hmm. And so, so, mm -hmm. but so Democrats haven't changed much, but Republicans have really changed on that. So, so I, well, I and that's behind a lot of the legislation we're seeing too. Right. Like, for instance, DEI effort, diversity, equity, and inclusion is being attacked in higher education with funding, with tax on different programs. Um, so I think they're, they're clumping together the, the liberal indoctrinating higher education professors like us, maybe, um, with you know ways of cutting budgets and uh, areas that are really attacking, with us, which I think is, is very, very detrimental long-term. We need education for our future. Yeah, that's a very good answer. I, I hadn't heard anybody point that out. Uh, you're the first professors I've seen mention that, that, okay, when it comes to how you feel about the other party and the distrust, they're probably both the same. On other measures, yeah, the Republicans more. I, have, I haven't seen anybody bring that up, that differentiation. Most of the stuff is just, it's all Republicans, Democrats a little bit, but it's mostly all them. I've never heard anybody break it up like this. So thank you very much. That's a new data point I haven't found. And there we go. all of this reading and all 70 interviews. So, hey, we learn something new every oh, day. There it is. Wow. Wow. Uh, yeah. Good for you. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me ask you, though. This is the meat and potatoes question, if I can. Oh, um, already had. <laughs> so I want to show you the map that has just strong opinions. Um, here it is. Uh, give me one that? second to pull up. Yeah. yeah. That's the great sword again. Yeah. Yeah, I had it. Sorry. Hmm. Got a lot of data there. I'm trying to understand. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I I jumped into this with a little bit of a background, and I'm um, a data researcher in my uh, professional life, so I'm kind of good at doing this. Except when I lose. There we go. Okay, here we go. I saw that. Uh, this is from the New York Times, came out in 2016. 
counties that voted for the Republican or Democratic presidential candidate by 20 percentage points or more. How large is the divide between red and blue in America? This is what Bill Bishop was talking about. This is the uh, New York Times backing it up a decade later. By the way, NPR has also backed this up. 538 has backed this up. A lot of people have backed it up and said, yeah, there's something going on. So if I may, I'd like to explain the map to you, and then I want to ask your reaction. So the map, the top left, very top all the way to the left, it's about 50% gray. So red means don't even run here if you're not a Republican. You have no chance. Republicans win here by 20 percentage points over the other candidate at the county level. So these maps are finely grained. Blue means don't even run here if you're a Democrat. Democrats win by 20 percentage points. These are called landslide election counties. Gray, though, mm -hmm. means sometimes we vote for McCain. And then sometimes Barack Obama has the right message for us. And we think that that speaks to us and where America's at. Mm -hmm. And then you can go over to uh, 96, 2000, the next rows, 2004, 2008, 2012. That map at the bottom is 2016. And I've talked to a couple of professors who say the trends are only more exacerbated now. But if you look at the map at the bottom, 2016, it's the bigger one. And you compare it to the map in the top left. Almost all of the gray has been completely wiped out. And yeah. what they're saying is that people are moving and or ideologically sorting themselves into these hardcore districts where they don't listen to the other side ever. Don't even bother running here. And where we can see that in the 90s, we actually had a competitive landscape for most of America, and now we have anything but. I've seen professors look at this and go, I reject your map. Is this true? Is this not true? Does the big sort exist, or is all this data fake and made up? Well, is this also a result of urbanization, growing urban populations, and out migration from rural areas. Sure. So sure. the concentration of those rural conservative votes, Wyoming, Nevada. Um, and, and even in the reddest state, including yeah. Iowa now, there are, you know, again, it's the urban and university counties that are still blue. So, so, but having said that, and then there's gerrymandering that goes yes. on that, that would sure. be part of this too. And that becomes, yeah, probably. But, I, th I think that there's um, there's something to this and that there clearly is something to this, that there's um, I there's different ways to explain it. I don't know that it is actually a great like it depends on what we mean by the great sort. Like 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 are people saying I'm out of here, like anecdotally, I know people that went out of Iowa because of uh, they have a gay child or they have a, a trans child. And they, they, or they're, they're, they're no longer able to get abortion services here or afraid that they're not going to be able to. And that these really, I, but that's just anecdotal. Now, how much that, now I've heard this about Florida, I've heard it other places. As I, well as people of gold color. I would be out migrated from some of these areas. Yeah, I would bet, like from what we learned, Anne, I don't remember people talking about that. They talked about, though, like a lot of the respondents talked about concerns about their children leaving and not coming. And uh, and their worries weren't about political policy or that they're not comfortable around Democrats or Republicans. A lot of it had to do with like, like remember that stuff? There's all that stuff about about how uh, um, our kids want to go. They go away to the big city. They go away to college, and they come back to these small towns. They don't have the amenities, right? We don't have good restaurants, or we don't have bike. I remember bike trails came up yeah. at one point, you know, yeah. or yeah. cool micro, houses, micro breweries. There we are. Cool restaurants. And, and so there was a frustration expressed that our, our that there's a kind of brain, a rural brain drain underway. Our data kind of shows that, right? And and uh, so. I don't know how much of that. So, so I think it would. I think there's a lot going into it, but the effect of it is probably true. The, the effect of it is probably what um, Bishop and others have noted that there there is something like division in a way. I listen to AM radio all the time. AM 1040. I listen to Catholic radio all the time. Uh, it's my go-to in my car, and I can't tell you how often we hear, like on on, on AM 1040 here in Iowa, uh, the big you know, sort of farm and, and a truck driver station, I suppose. <laughs> um, but, but you hear people talk about that. You know, this is God's country or this is this is the place where um, 
you know, if, if you want to live free, come here to a red state or come here to Iowa where, where Republicans are in charge and you can be free. And we're hearing that definitely from um, people like Ron DeSantis talking in those terms, like like wanting, at least claiming that they want uh they want to encourage something like out migration of the opposite political party and in migration of those within. And I, I think California, I think this is happening too, right? Who, who said they want to encourage that? Oh, I think this is definitely that, like, like I think, so I, what I'm hearing is like Ron DeSantis' statements about, about Florida being the place where woke goes to die. Um, right. So don't come here. Like, I think I heard it was Scott, right? Uh, uh, Senator Scott, uh, Rick Scott, former governor, just last week saying, don't come, don't come here. Now, I think oh, yes, yes, here. yes, don't yes. There are many conservative here. governors. Who said, don't yeah, we don't want to. Right. Yeah. So, so right. you won't be comfortable here. Yeah. And so uh, and then I think your state, California, right? I think that new uh, um Gavin Newsom said something along the lines of that, that he wants to be a safe haven or a kind of a refuge mm -hmm. state, right? Yeah. For those on on uh, uh, on the left. For abortion access and for LGBTQ rights. Uh, yeah. And, 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 of state money for that. and it may well be that these wedge issues are no longer being used just to shape elect elections, but maybe they really are. Maybe they are very punitive, some of these laws. I, I'll give you that there were Republican governors saying, if you're California or a liberal, this isn't a great place for you. Don't come here. Um, Newsom never did that. However, during the recall election, Governor Newsom said that anybody who backs the recall is a white supremacist. And I got to tell you, my mom, who's full blood Mexican, was quite offended at that statement. So it's happening on both sides. Just want to put that out there. So you believe the big sword is real. Something like this might be happening. We're not sure people, it's everybody just moving geographically. Maybe it's partly that. And maybe like you said, uh, we're losing our young people. We're losing yeah. our LGBTQ people. We're losing our immigrants. And then that just leaves- Educated people. The, the right. educated people. And that kind of just leaves yeah. everybody left behind who becomes even more group think, hardcore conservative. I, I think also- this has shifted. It's it's a complicated landscape. It's not necessarily you know it's not up or down, black or white. Um, but I think COVID actually they're seeing data and trends now where people were more likely to move out, move back to or to more rural areas or at least exurban areas during COVID. So and leaving the big cities with the crime and the like lack like, of you know access for transportation and all the problems etc with big cities so it would be interesting to see this map that's not necessarily but i think some of it's reflected in the politics of 2022 for example kind of post-covid post-pandemic to see how that's also yeah i i don't have the map i was told by a professor who researched into this that it's even worse on the map the 2016 okay. one is even more polarized when you go to 2022, but I don't have that map to show. You're right. So, so it like if I think what we would say is that it, if it's showing up in the map and the map is accurate, it's real in effect. I, it may not be caused by an intentionality to generate uh, polarized or one party states or one party districts. I'm not sure that that's it. Yeah. Yeah. But there's no evidence showing that people are going, I want to convert Nebraska into all Republicans. Hey guys, let's all move. It's, they're not even sure if it's you're moving because you want people who vote like you or you're attracted to a particular lifestyle change and you adopt the voting when you get there. It, there's, there's a debate on that. I'm more just concerned if, as Americans, we can say it's happening or it's not happening because I've many professors who studied political polarization have not heard of the big sort and have never seen these maps before. And yet they're academic professors on political polarization and they have no idea about this concept. And so I'm trying to find out. I mean, if if there's a debate in academia, what good does the public have? So I'm trying to find out, is this real? Is this not happening? I've had professors say, no, that's real, not real. I've had other professors say I've never heard it. Then I have other professors like you guys going, yeah, I studied geography. This is definitely real. So you can see how confused a lay person would be. What am I supposed to think? Why is there so many different opinions in academia? 
Well, like again, like I, it's the complexity here. So, so it's it's an easy framing in terms of Republican Democrat partisanship, but but that's again that's too easy. It's it's much more complex. So it's economic issues, yeah, yeah. It's jobs. I mean, it's a sense of place. To talk right? to. Yeah. Their kids, you know, they grew up. They might have gotten a community college education, two year degree or four year degree. And there just weren't job opportunities in rural Nebraska, rural Iowa. Um, so I think it's economic opportunities as well. And True. land prices are, it's hard to start a farm in the rural areas because land is so expensive. Uh, equipment is really expensive. So a younger generation is not going to land in you know, those areas. That, that makes sense. Um, let me ask you two follow up questions. Do you see this trend getting better over time naturally, short of a intervention or a lot of people have said national marriage counseling is a term. If there is no, yeah, that was when Marjorie Taylor Greene said we need a national divorce, there was a Utah governor who said we need marriage counseling. Marriage counseling. There we go. Um, I'm all for that. Uh, it didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. Usually people don't go to marriage counseling yeah. way too good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, my, Basically, my... Let's, let's work together to get a good at separation. <laughs> what, what, um, is there? So, basically, the question is two parts Do you think it's going to get better naturally on its own? Like, hey, it'll just peter out and people will calm down, or does there has to be an intervention to make this better? And if an intervention is necessary, what kind of intervention? is going to get around 100 million people who've been sorting themselves over three decades to undo it. It's a two-parter, because we have a two-fur. Yeah, well, there we go, tag team. Yeah, again, like, like I just say, I don't know that this sorting is happening because of a desire for political unity. I'm, I'm not sure that's the reason. It's okay. happening in effect. Okay. So understand the cause, so to me, it would be it, you have to understand the cause okay. of polarization in order to, even begin to come up with a solution to it. And um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm, no, I, would, I would also put it in the hands or at the, in the laps of our leaders, our political leaders who need to, you know, demonstrate compromise. You can look at the recent you know, debt ceiling debates and legislation that went through, but who need to be able to, to go to the table and, and talk civilly and be, you know, polite at least um, when you're dealing with the, the opposition. So I think that the leadership, uh, it's, it's iffy, is if the leadership is kind of modeling that type of unity or at least civility and working together. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, and I don't know if that's going to happen with some of the personalities that are. Well, okay, so let me ask you, what would marriage counseling look like? If you're going to marriage counsel all of America that's been <laughs> starting from 1992 over three decades, now we're looking at one to two generations deep, and we're looking at the numbers of at least 100 million, maybe more. What does marriage counseling look like for that? And, and who's going to be that marriage counselor? Um, okay, so... Like, all right, it wouldn't work unless both parties wanted to work, right? And I don't know. So you know it would. You'd have to have. Uh, you'd have to have. You'd have to have a desire for moderation. Um, it would have to be an end. Like, like so. Instead of having my side win, I'm going to make certain that no Democrat wins. I'm going to right if that's it, or the other side. I'm going to make sure no Republican wins. If that's the goal, there's no way. But if you actually set as a goal, a political goal, I want inclusiveness. I want Toler people to be tolerance. heard. I want tolerance. I want to understand. I want to make good policy. Just that. I'm a politician. I want to make good policy. I want to make good policy. I want to make sure that my policy works. I want to make sure that the ends I'm aiming at can be arrived at with the policy solutions I'm pushing. In other words, if you just begin with that, I'd like, so marriage counseling, I'd like this to be a good marriage, right? You would have to be a desire for it. 
And I, again, and so I think it's back to leadership. There were reports, so Iowa since 2016, um, you know, we are a trifecta state where the governor uh, has been uh, strongly held in Republican hands now, and both houses in the legislature as well. And there, there have been reporting about incivility in the Iowa legislature uh, this year. And it, and it really is things like like not like creating a budget, like like presenting a budget. So the Republicans have a majority and they presented a budget, gave it to Democrats, apparently had no numbers in it. I wasn't accounted. <laughs> so I can't imagine the frustration that would generate. But but it, but it's instant. so desiring, desiring a functioning politics. I, I have many friends who say to me, we've got to have a functioning, like we can't have a one party state. We need a functioning Republican party if they're Democrat. We, we have to have, that's the only way a plural society, a multicultural society, a, a society, a society where people have, in my own work, radically contradictory notions of what the Christian God is and what it means to be a Christian, radically different notions of this. We can't talk to each other unless we want to. Right, we can't form a union unless we want it to work, and that's what seems to be necessary. So, so I'm not even sure how that would happen, but it would have to be. A goal. Yeah. Who who is that person? Who's the person? If you can name anyone who has any reputation at all, it can't be some local person you've heard of and know, but somebody who has some sort of national reputation who could speak to both sides and bring them together. Can you name one person known in politics today who you think could do that? Well, I would say Amy Klobuchar, um, Pete Buttigieg. Um, Pete Buttigieg is going to bring the Republicans in? Yeah, they're, 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 yeah, uh, yeah they would be a, he's very good. I mean, I mean, he's if you just go by fair, manner and, and content, he is actually remarkably he actually won. verbal. He but won. he does not pull well with them. I could see Amy Klobuchar, though. So she did yeah. pretty well. Yeah. So another thing that I was going to point out, which we have, we've kind of skirted around a little bit, but just the basic demographics of this country and Iowa, for example. We're becoming a much more brown, a much less white, a lower percentage of white um, European ancestry population. So I think that just the demographics alone for education, for jobs, for just the outright future of our country, there needs to be more tolerance, uh, more respect, and support for right now, we have underrepresented populations, but in many parts of the country, they're the majority of color. So I think that the point about just the future and demographics for these different areas of our society, we're going to have to get along. We're going to have to, you know, accept the reality of how we're going to have people work in the workforce and have people come and enroll in our higher education. I hope so. I, I talked to somebody and he said, hey, there's a lot of Latinos moving into town. And I go, great. Are they dating, marrying people, working at the same jobs, going to schools? Or are they largely isolated to the edge of town and work exclusively as farm laborers and nobody actually hangs out with them? Those are two different depictions on if we're going to have a cohesive society. That's neither here nor there. I always tell people, look at the movie Farmingville, where only 100 Mexicans showed up in a small town in upstate New York, and you could see how real Americans reacted to diversity. These people thought they were so liberal and so diverse, and they couldn't hack it. Every city in California has 100 Mexicans. They dropped 100 into one place called Farmingville, New York. They lost their mind, and those were liberals. So I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I would love to see that. Let me ask you about this, though. We're talking about the future. Have you heard of Norman Ornstein? Norman Ornstein's a demographer, uh, and this is what he says. I want to repeat a statistic I use in every talk. By 2040 or so, 70% of Americans will live in 15 states, meaning 30% of Americans will choose 70 senators. And the 30% will be older, whiter, more rural, and more male than the 70% unsettling, to say the least, He's basing that on the U.S. Census, which projects that trend out to the year 2045, or when we are projected to have a space base on Mars. No, I'm not exaggerating. So is this a good sign 
or a bad sign that things are going to get worse? I think it's the reality. However, it's the future. So good or bad, depending on where you're coming from. Um, but I think this also illustrates the some, some of the flaws within our electoral process. Sure, sure. And Let's just all yeah. these rural states can have uh, un, you know an unrepresentative or disproportionate amount of power. That's why there's so much money going into the the USDA and the ag bills, ag reform bills. When we're talking about polarization, picture it's the year 2030. And uh, 15 states have 70% of the population, and they said, we want this person as president and these laws. And then 35 states who only have 30% of the population said, no, we disagree. And since we have more senators and more electoral college distribution we get the person that we want and you get nothing would that be good or bad for political polarization i i don't know again it's just it's uh, might i just suggest a couple books um sure uh, one of them is by jill quidday no. um uh and the title of it her, her her most famous book is called the color of welfare but really all of Jill Quidag, you know, she's president of the American Sociological Association. Um, uh, and, and then the other, the other scholar is Theda Scotchpole. Both of them have done work on um, sort of the American political policy system. Um, and like Anne was just saying, the electoral system. And um, they, like, like Quidagno studied the difficulties of passing social security and how um, the and, and the color of welfare was really about the long-term electoral consequences of passing uh, the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act in the mid 1960s. And her argument is that you know the we there is a kind of non-democratic or undemocratic or let's say less than perfectly democratic element in America. It is linked to the Senate and to the way that seniority is handed up. You know, seniority determines who has control of committees. And, um, and she really, at, at a kind of, like, like so for our, for example, our senior senator is Chuck Grassley, whose mother was born in the 19th century, right? Uh, and that's not a joke or an exaggeration. His mother was born in the 19th century. And um, he, he was sort of the linchpin in determining healthcare policy uh, during the um, Obama, uh, uh, the effort to get Obamacare passed, and that that, that what that the way that the structure works, and Cordago is really good at laying this out, is that um, this it, it has to do with the seniority system in terms of giving power to particular senators, and then the again the kind of less it's not representative, right? So we don't wind up with one person, one vote, we wind up with some states, like my home state of South Dakota, where it's, you know, 800,000 people, and we have as much political influence as, you know, on, you know, 40 million people in, in your state, right? Right, and right, so, right. And so, so you don't, so that would be my, so if you look structurally again, at a kind of complex, um, um, the complexity of the structural, um, um, confines that policy has to work its way through. It, it, this isn't good. Of course it's not good. Of course it's not good. I have to ask. My opinion doesn't matter. I can't go, hey, everybody, I feel strongly. The only way I can get people to listen if I can go, I got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 professors who say it's bad. Then people listen and they stop arguing. So I, my opinion doesn't matter. I have to ask obvious questions because I've, I've tried to have this conversation going, come on, you know, it's bad. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I got 50 professors who say so. Oh, now I'll shut up and listen. That's that's the way it is these days. They just don't, you know, you got to overwhelm them with data. Let me ask you, uh, that was a great answer. Thank you. Uh, the term that I see in uh, popular conversation, not academia, is Tom, uh, tyranny of the minority. And basically what they're saying is that you have these small states. It used to be about making everybody equal, but now these small states have a fraction of the population and they're controlling the whole government and it's undemocratic. And that's why we had Amy Coney Barrett get into the Supreme Court and Brett uh, 
Kavanaugh and George W. Bush and Donald Trump and people, especially in California, are starting to wake up to that and become very angry when they realize unless you change the Constitution, it's never going to change. Unless you can convince 35 states to politically neuter themselves and say, hey, I know you've had outsized influence and the ability to have an influence in Congress. Can you remove all that for the good of the country so you'll never have influence and people can just ignore you? And you got to get 35 states to do that before you could ever make the change. When we start telling the Californians, they get very skeptical of the Constitution. Just got to say. Well, I think they're beginning to make inroads a little bit on that. And I was maybe a case study. They don't want us as the first Democratic or the first caucus. True. We've true. Been demoted. Iowa the state has been demoted for just those reasons. Uh, true. California tried to move the primary there, and then other states immediately moved their data ahead of California's to swing yeah, back. Yeah. I think they're they're um, promoting that <laughs> argument a little bit. Uh, did you guys ever see signs of polarization in Iowa before Trump? The big sort of saying sorting started in 1992. Hmm. We certainly had some polarization in the early thousands. Uh, the Obama presidency saw some controversy. Did you see any signs or did it, it seem to just kind of blow up with Trump? It, it, I think that there's a long, really long history in Iowa of sort of both, both parties, right? I mean, if you go back and look at who was senator, who was congressperson, who was governor. When I arrived here, I think, I can't remember who, I think Chuck Culver, I think. 2004, I can't remember anyway, but but we've had both Democrat and Republican governors and Democrat and uh, we had Harkin, uh, Democrat Senator Harkin. Um, and, you know, so it was it wasn't like Oklahoma uh, or, you know, um, or Wyoming, where it really is just solid red and always red. It was it flipped back and forth, you know, and I so I think and, and again, like the policy positions, you know, I, I think Grassley's claim to fame as a young uh, uh, senator back in the 70s or 80s or 60s, whenever, I think it was 70s is probably when he probably was a congressperson first, but he was famous as a cost cutter and being, you know, holding a hammer up on national television saying this hammer costs $400 or something, right? I mean, it was, I remember that. Yeah. I mean, My that grandpa was, showed me that. Yeah. And, you know, he's, he's, I think he's 90 now. He's very close to 90. Um, and again, it's just it's just a different world now. And being a Republican in Iowa means something different mm -hmm. than it yeah, did. I agree. We used to be the education state, right? That was our that's our coin. If you look at the Iowa quarter, and it's, a, it's the education state. We yeah. were we were also one of the first states to um, allow gay marriage. Yeah. Hey. The marriage. 2010. Yeah. So uh, we yeah. put so much on. Yeah. Yeah. And now we have, we just had a no say, uh, don't say gay, at the, you know, that's not the title, but that's the popular term for it. Uh, it just passed uh, the legislature and signed into law last week. So. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to bear down on that. I, I need to keep it kind of like on the major subject because we're on YouTube. Yeah. Um, uh, so there are, you know, you got to watch your P's and Q's. Uh, I hope that you found this was a fair interview and not gotcha journalism. I didn't try to trick you guys. You got to say your piece. Do you know anybody else who might be willing to be part of an honest conversation? They could be academics. They could not be academics. Is there anybody you can think of who's, oh, you know, so-and-so might be willing right, to Jill. Jill Quidday. If you can get her, she'd be fantastic. I'll reach out to her. Jill Quidagno. We got her up on screen. Yeah. Quidagno. Quidagno. That sounds Filipino. I'll find out. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she can think of? Catherine, the... Oh, Kathy Kramer. Rural, rural, rural resentment. Yeah, Kathy Kramer. Kathy Kramer at UW Madison. And then the person who's coming here in the fall. Um, Shannon Manat. Shannon Manat would be her. Yeah, she'd be wonderful, actually. So, Catherine, K R A M E R? Yes. And she's a professor? For some reason, I want to say C, C R. Yeah, she, uh, she yes, wrote the. Right, C. I think it's C R A M E R. And mm -hmm. she. Politics of resentment, right? Yeah. Is the title. Politics of resentment. And then who was VW Madison? No, at um, Kramer is at UW Madison. Oh, sorry. It's political science. Yeah, that's all right. That's got it. Response. Got it. Got it. Okay. I will definitely reach out to Catherine Kramer and Jill Quidago. And then uh, yeah, Shannon yeah. Monat. 
M O N N A T. M O N A T. Shannon Monat. Where's she at? Does rural sociology. No. Oh, um, Syracuse. Is she I'll right? find her. I'll find her. Okay. Shannon Monat, Jill Quidago, and Catherine Kramer. Yeah. Uh, if you're watching this, I'm going to do my best to get a hold of you and try to convince you to do an interview. Thank you so much. Uh, last question for you guys. Uh oh. When this is kind of a tough one. So when Marjorie Taylor Greene came out and said, hey, I, we need a national divorce because we're so polarized and we can't get along with each other. Uh, There's a lot of controversy and she didn't explain everything. Some people like her. Some people don't. That's not the question. What I noticed was the media for the first month said, oh, Marjorie, there's no polarization. You're an idiot. And I knew that was wrong. And a month, the second month after the conversation didn't die down, there was a new wave of articles. And they said, oh, yeah, there's polarization, but it's because of social media, the media and extreme politicians are gerrymandering. And they completely left out the big sort. Here's my question for the two of you. Politization of the media, you could say maybe 2000, 2010. Social media started becoming a big influence, maybe 2015, 2017. Extreme politicians were really the last two years of Trump's. Uh, administration and gerrymandering really came out for the first time in 2000, but it wasn't that impactful till 2010. This, that's what political historians are saying. So the big sort predates all of those things by 20 years. Yeah. How come everybody who talked about political polarization across all media mentioned everything else, but the big sort when the big sort predates all of them by 20 years? Well, maybe they're looking at a different era. But Reagan, I mean, a lot of this started actually back in the 80s. A new liberal push and sure. tax reduction and in terms of the economy and politics. So maybe they're they're kind of referring more to the Reagan. And it was also very divided um, and polarizing. Maybe the Bush administration, too. And then... After 911, we kind of, you know, worked together a little bit better. So I, I have this speculation. And if you, if I, if I would, I, I just, um, you know, if you're if you're serious about understanding anything, um, the complexity of the warp and weft of a social system requires a lot of study, and you you have to start somewhere, and if something like the great sort is important, it'll emerge, right? It'll become, it'll become ever clearer in the data as time goes on. And um, the other thing I would say, you know, I, 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 not everything maps onto a, a divide between, you know, the, the polarization between Republicans and Democrats. It's, a, it's part of a story, but the bigger story is kind of like what Ann was just saying. I mean, we're in the midst of a reconstruction of global capitalism has been underway for a long time. It has all kinds of political and social impacts. And um, social, identities. social identities are altering. Changing and, dramatically. And as you say, the media landscape is altering and so on. So it just, it just again, if you're serious, it just takes a long time. And, and you have to enter somewhere. And then you have to hope that as you begin unraveling it, eventually you get to the things that really matter, you know, but it, it takes, it takes time to do it often. So. Right. But the, the big sort was mentioned by national media chains, six months, nine months, 12 months prior. And then after Marjorie Taylor Greene makes her tweet, they all forget about their own reporting and they focus on every other factor except the big sort to the point that they basically don't mention it at all when it has the largest track record of, uh, documentation and being reported on. Isn't that at least a little bit strange? You've been talking about this one thing for the longest time, and then when the topic is super relevant, you accidentally blank out on it? No, I don't think it's strange. I I, I think that, um, again, the logic of whatever uh, click-based, you know, clickbait headline media, whatever the, whatever the revenue model is today for this, I mean, and we both know how much our journalism department is struggling. I mean, everybody's struggling in the in the media landscape. It's hard, and the, the, you know, we, it's always been a kind of topic of the moment, topicality, emotion. And I think that's you know, we we don't have a long memory. And I mean, you can't have hard, right? You're not going to get 
clicks possibly. So I, so I, I wouldn't say it's a bias as much as just the way, I mean, you'd have to talk to journalists about that. But the one thing I would say is that of all of the people um, I would seek uh, for reasoned analysis of the future of politics in America, I don't think I would seek out someone with a history of inflammatory tweeting. It's not meant as, again, that's what we teach people to do is to reason, right? And, and, and to be able to provide reasons for the positions that you take. And so just being emotional, again, that's not, that's not what we do. Maybe that's what the media does. It's certainly what certain brands of politicians do. But, but, but you and I both know that's not serious. Seriousness, um, it requires yeah, time and exactly. effort. There's socially necessary labor time that goes into the production of things. And, and there needs to be reasons, reasons. What are the reasons behind the position um, that, that you have, right? And, that's, and then to be able to document that with, with um, again, if we want our yeah, policy yeah, positions yeah. to work, if we want our politics to work, if we want governance to work, if we want our society to form a more perfect union, you've got to find a way um, to reason and research our way into better policy. You know, it's got to be done. So that, that would be my stand. So that's <laughs> how do we um, how do we desort America? Um, I, I, again, you have to understand the causes of it, and then um, I, I don't know. I mean, again, it it, it depends <laughs> depends what the causes are. It, you have to you have to address the causes. So let me let me let me throw out a theoretical scenario. Theoretical, purely theoretical. Let's say this is an alternate universe, and we know for a fact that going back to the 90s, people on the left and people on the right just don't like each other for values, for lifestyle, and every year it gets worse, and that's the major reason. And they've been sorting for 30 years, and that was the start, and as they get more sorted, some of them say, well, let's say do gerrymandering so we can hold on to our sort. And then some say, let's do more social media extreme titles so we can hold on to our sword. And let's do more extreme politicians. But it all comes back to, I don't like you. You're left. I'm red. And I'm going to go move or move myself into an ideological community. And that is the main driver. If, I get it's an if, I get we can't tell, a lot of factors to tell. But in this alternate universe, if after all the research it came out that that, that was the main driver for 30 years, at a hundred million person level, how would you desort that in this alternative universe? Yeah. yeah, I guess I would, you know, I would have issues with some of the basic assumptions with that. Uh, but one of the things that has is changing, and everything changes. That's one thing we can count on: is change and dynamics. I think, and we work with young people. We teach, we're in higher education. We're, we work with young people a lot, at least of, the, of this age group, now the Gen Zs. And there's, there's such different thinking now about not just politics, but about you know how to get along with people and tolerance of people who don't have the same sexual orientation or color skin or language or religion. Um, that I, I, maybe that's a little bit more optimistic, but that's my hope is that future generations, if they can get unstuck from, you know, this world that we've created, you know, they're much more environmentalist, environmentally oriented. Um, so I see some hope and, and change through the tolerance and respect and foresight that this, and they're a savvy generation, you know, they've been exposed to a lot of, a lot of different things in their lifetime. Um, so I think that that might bring about, bring about some of this, what you call sorting or the big sort because of the younger generation. We can hope. We can hope. Um, <laughs> I, you know, just the, just the last thing, I, you know, just to say that it, it doesn't, I don't think that it works that way in reality. I don't, I don't think that Republicans don't like each other too, right? I mean, I mean, you know, there's a famous line from Emil Durkheim, a great sociologist, and he says, look, in a, in a community of saints where no one really commits a crime, small little misdemeanors will be treated as a major sacrilege, right? That you're going to create crime. And, you know, if you put a whole bunch of people who are Republican together, 
and they don't have Democrats in their midst, the differences within the Republican coalition are going to become apparent. And the same is true of Democrats. You take a bunch of Democrats and you're going to find that some are pro-business, some are pro-regulation, some are anti-regulation, some are, right? There's all kinds of different um, fractures within each of these coalitions. So, so it isn't right and left. And, and maybe our system does require two parties. I think it's built that way uh, where there's a two-party dominance, but the content of the parties can change over time. And uh, that's, that's fair. That's yeah. fair. Yeah. I would like to point out this one poll from Pew Research Center, October 2017, partisan divide on political values grows even wider, October 5th, 2017, Pew Research Center. What it shows is that going back to 1994 to the year 2017, the difference of Americans faced on race, religion, school attendance, education, age, gender, basically petered out and has stayed the same over the last 30 years. When we look at political party, it is the only one that has doubled. So you can see all those lines going kind of straight. That's every other way to categorize a person. And then that one line that shoots way up to the top, that's political party polarization. The Pew Research Center is saying that's the one form of identity and the only one that's doubled since 1994. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a term, it's an identity now. It isn't just a membership in a political association sure. uh, that promotes reason policy. It's an yeah. And that's the change, right? And maybe that's what we need. It's just people with a hunger for reasoned policy and effective governance um, that are going to realize we need people from a variety of value positions working together to find solutions for problems we have. You know? I agree. I hope so. Um, I, you know, I would like to see AOC say, hey, Trump had a few ideas. I'd like to see Donald Trump say, hey, not everything AOC said was wrong. I think if we saw stuff like that, but you laugh, right? I think mean, if we saw stuff like that, that would be great. Sir, it's a very you can't even talk about that without going on. I, I, I would say, unicorn. Just to say, in a room together, those are celebrity uh, uh, figures, Positions. and I think that this will fix when a democracy functions as a democracy, and it's everyday people, not celebrity. We we should be going to people for solutions, not to celebrities, right? And so what AOC wants or what Donald Trump wants is probably a lot less important than what people in, say, uh, you know, Spencer Iowa want to do about their local park or what they want to do about uh, building a workforce or something, right? I mean, it's, it's, it really is on the ground. That's what democracy is, right? It's people living a free life and, and helping them do it is what we uh, what uh, I'm hoping we have to do. So. Liliana Mason seemed to suggest that it was about getting at what you're saying, Professor Creer, that... Um, it was about being willing to lose as long for the good of the country, for the best policy, I'm willing to occasionally lose. Sure. And when you lose that ability, we get polarization. And I don't see either party really being willing to lose. I mean, every election, they're going existential threat. It's the end of everything we know if the other party wins. They've been doing that messaging for the last eight years. Um <laughs> They've got to totally flip that on the backs and go, you know what, guys, we're going to try hard, but it's okay if we lose. That's what both of them would have to start doing. And I'll, I haven't seen anybody say anything like that. I hope they do. I really do. Uh, here's the last question for both of you. This is the thing I always ask every professor. You're not you. You're not me. You're a third person watching this interview. It's five days from now. And you're thinking to yourself, well, wow, that was a good interview. There was a lot there. I can't remember everything, but I, there was this one thing the professor said at the end, and I just, I can't get it out of my head. What is that one thought you want a totally random person you've never met to not be able to forget five days from now? We'll start with Professor Oberhauser since she came in first. Okay. Well, I don't know if I've said it yet, but what I would say is, um, I don't think we can give up on this process. And I think there's a lot of potential um, and a lot of opportunities out there. So, but it's gonna take hard work. It's gonna take some data driven and some scientific analysis of the issues that we're trying to address because they are huge issues. I mean, they're, they are extent existential in terms of the environment, for example. I, I do believe that 
what we're facing with climate change is existential, and that's going to change all of us. Uh, but I think that if we can apply and be our best people and draw from our best resources and our best brains in science, that we will definitely get through this. And there's a lot of positive things on the other end. Professor Clear, what is the one thought you would like people to not be able to get out of their head five days from now, Professor? Um, elites do well when common people fight against each other. That's brilliant. Succinct. Um, we are. Let's stand sometimes. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Not always. <laughs> No, actually, don't have them read our papers. They're all open access. Yeah. 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 They're open access, so have them read our papers. And we're open for any discussion, questions, comments. I really appreciate both of you doing this. Um, it's been hard to get a hold of Midwestern professors located in the center of America. Um, almost all of them are on the coasts or Texas that I can get a hold of. So it was a nice data point, and both of you were detailed and in depth and you were willing to entertain the theoretical questions and also you provided a level of understanding in more depth than we had seen in some of the other interviews so i thank you very much this has been highly informative okay we're good we appreciate that and we're no longer just the flyover state <laughs> nope you're you're my favorite professors don't tell the other professors okay come on and okay. see us in ames in des moines okay uh, thank you both for being here. I will email you a copy of the video in a few hours. Uh, if you have any other recommendations, uh, I'd appreciate it. But I got three and I love it. Thank you so much. Wow. And I'll email you shortly and I want to say thank you to both of you coming out. We look forward to seeing it. Thank you. Great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that virtual high five before we go. Yeah, virtual high five. Uh, high five. <laughs> high five.